Okay, here we are, uh, Hebrews, The Glorious Jesus. This is lesson number 12 in the series, The Glory of the Church of Christ, part two in this particular theme. We're in Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll try to cover, Lord willing, verses one to 40 today. So after having shown Christ's glory by demonstrating His superiority over the Jewish uh, religion as its fulfillment, our author goes on to exhort his hearers to reflect that glory as Jesus' disciples by being faithful to Him. You know, he's the glorious Jesus, you're the glorious church that belongs to Him. We'll glorify Him, how? By being faithful to Him. He encourages them not to shrink back and fall away as some have done in the past, but because they have such a great mediator in Jesus Christ, he tells them they should go forward in confidence despite the obstacles that they may be facing at that time. So that's the setup that gets us to chapter 11, because in chapter 11 he gives them a shortened version of their own history, their own Jewish history, highlighting those individuals who, despite difficulty, continued to believe and serve God faithfully. So he goes through this kind of rallying cry to show them two things. First of all, to show them that faith has always been the key response that God has desired from His people. Not ceremony, not eloquence, not performance. It's not like He didn't care about these things, but these were not the things that were of priority with God. Faith has always been the priority. And secondly, that His readers are recipients of the blessings that all of their predecessors were faithfully waiting for. The Jews in the Old Testament, they waited for the promises to be fulfilled well, but the people that the Hebrew writer is writing to, they've received the promise. The promises have been fulfilled, but their ancestors, you know, they were faithful, but they died never having seen the promises fulfilled. So you know, the argument is, hey, if they could never having seen the promise, but still remain faithful in hope of it, surely you people who have seen the promises fulfilled, surely you can remain faithful. And so we begin in uh, verse 1, chapter 11, uh, a description of this faith. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so this first verse is a, a, a description of faith more than a definition of faith. Uh, faith in the Old Testament you know, meant uh, confidence in God, perseverance, vision of the unseen, vision of the future, you know, that's, that, was, you know, that was the element, the idea of faith in the Old Testament. In the, Old, in the New Testament, the, the faith has been elaborated, become a little more specific. Faith in the New Testament is believing as true the claims of Jesus Christ, uh, having a personal commitment to Him as Lord, uh, obedience to His teachings, uh, trust in Him and the promises that He has made to us. And so the author says that faith is two things. Number one, it's assurance. Interesting, the word used here, the original Greek word used here, meant the substructure or the foundation of a building. Uh, secondly, he says it's a conviction. The Greek word was a legal term referring to evidence upon which a case was built. And so, and then hope, uh, he talks about hope as things that are not seen. These refer to the blessings and the promises made by God through Christ. I mean, you know, we, we, we don't see them. They're promises, they're forgiveness, resurrection, eternal life. Some we have right away, like forgiveness of sins. We don't see that, but we, we have it right away. Other things we don't see right away and we don't have right away. Eternal life, resurrection, so on and so forth. So based on the understanding of these words, the author is saying that faith, what it was in the Old Testament, fully realized in the New Testament, serves as a basis from which people gain the ability to stake their lives on unseen realities. And so the foundation that permits hope, the eyes that allow us to see the things that are in the invisible realm. In verse two, he makes a comment. Uh, the comment is, for by it the men of old gained approval. So in verse two, the author makes one of four comments concerning faith in this passage. So he talks about faith 
then makes a comment on it, talks some more about individuals and what they did, makes a second comment, so on and so forth. And I'll show you where these comments show up in the, in the passage. In this first comment, he states that it is by faith, in other words, confidence of things that are not seen, that men, speaking of their traditional Jewish ancestors, gained approval from God. And he reaffirms that this has always been the basis by which God approves of men whether they have faith or not. And this is not a new idea. He will now go on to give numerous examples of people who were spoken well of by God. Why? Because of their faith. Even when God talks about the things that a person did and speaks well of those things, the idea is that the person did what they did because of their faith. So in verse three, the first thing he talks about is creation, interesting. He says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are um, uh, visible. So before going on to specific people to confirm his statement, he uses the fact that creation as a universal example of faith, he uses this as his basis for understanding. You know, we can only grasp the fact of creation by faith since it cannot be supported by scientific evidence. We can deduce, but there are no witnesses. See what I'm saying? However, if we believe God's word on this matter, the reason, the nature, and the purpose for creation becomes clear to us. We see by the eyes of faith. We understand by the eyes of faith how things were done, how this world came to be. So when he's talking about faith, he begins not by talking about the faith of a man or a woman in the Old Testament, he begins by talking about the creation itself and how faith is necessary in order to understand the creation in which we live. Then he moves on to an individual and he says, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So now the author continues by citing examples and results of faith as exhibited by people. All right? So Abel's sacrifice was accepted because it was offered in faith. And because of this, uh, there's a certain result. And what was the result of the sacrifice offered in faith? Well, he was considered righteous he was considered acceptable by God. And his example of faith, the author says, still speaks. In other words, his example still is referred to uh, and presented in the scriptures as a, an example of, of faith. And so examples of faith are powerful witnesses that extend beyond our lifetimes. And he's talking about Abel. He goes all the way back to the very beginning. He said, look how powerful faith is. There, the example of faith by one man you know, has come through all of history to us uh, today. That's how powerful the witness of faith is. Talks about another um, ancient uh, personality, uh, Enoch in uh, Hebrews 11:5. He says, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up he was pleasing to God. And so his faith, Enoch's faith, was pleasing to God in some way, and in some way he was translated into the spiritual dimension without conventional, the conventional dying process. The key is not the mysterious way he went to heaven. The key is the fact that his faith was something that was pleasing to God. That's the key. You know, the author begins his examples from earliest times of history to show that faith has always been what God looked for in men and that there was a reward for their faith. Abel, Abel's faith speaks to us today. Uh, Enoch, his faith resulted in his translation into the spiritual realm with bypassing conventional human, uh, human death. But it's always been, always been by faith. Even his first act in natural history, uh, God's first act in natural history, required faith in order to be perceived. Now he's going to make a second comment. Okay? Remember I told you there are four comments, so he makes a second comment in verse six. 
He says that without faith, it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So the author now makes a second comment concerning faith, which elaborates on his earlier statement. Not only does faith please God, he says, but it's impossible to please God without it. God rewards those who have faith. And again, we've seen an example, Enoch. So it's a, a matter of faith to live in hope and to look towards things not seen. Uh, and in the very next uh, series of verses, the author talks about people who demonstrated this vision based on faith. In other words, people who have faith see something that other people do not. And because of this, they see what they see, but because of this, they also receive a reward. So he, he starts you know, giving us examples of these people that, that saw something because of faith. And he begins with Noah. He says, by faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So Noah believed God at his word about an unseen, and as far as Noah is concerned, an unlikely event. And his faith responded in obedience. And what did he do? Well, he built the ark. His faith saved him and his household from the flood. And here the author says you know, that he preached to others for over a hundred years, but they disbelieved. And because of their disbelief expressed in disobedience, they were lost when the flood came. He mentions another such individual. Uh, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, for he was looking for the city which, was, which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So called to an unknown land which God said would be his, and yet Abraham wandered all over it and never owned any part of it except the place where he you know, buried his wife. I mean, the author is showing the life here of a person who truly saw a vision based on faith. Abraham lived in tents, and yet in faith he waited patiently for his eternal and permanent resting place and home promised to him by God. And how did he do this? He did, he did this all by the power of faith. We continue to read verse 11, he says, by faith even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And so promised a great posterity and people after him and yet his wife bore him one child, a single son, long after childbearing years. I mean, despite the evidence to the contrary, Abraham never wavered in his belief that God would make good on his promise. In the middle of his uh, discussion about Abraham's faith, the writer makes a third comment about uh, those of which he has uh, yet spoken. So the next, the third comment is in verses 13 to 16. So he says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So he says that these people saw by faith the things that were promised, the spiritual realities mentioned, but they died before these promises were actually in hand. What were the promises? Well, they'd have a better country. They'd have a better homeland. And for them, this meant heaven. This meant heaven, you know, the, 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 this, this was an, imi an image of heaven, the better homeland, the better country, it was heaven. They were waiting for heaven, just like we're waiting for heaven. 
However, because they saw through faith, they were willing to bear the difficulties brought about by their vision and never considered turning back to their original homeland. That's what he's saying. They knew where they came from, but they never went back there. Instead, they died in foreign lands where they wandered all of their lives. They, they did so because they believed and because of this, God was not ashamed to be associated with them. And what does he mean by that? Well, you know, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit, how does he refer to these people? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You know, but Abraham never called God that. You know, you're the God of me. He never, he never, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit in the mouth of others described God as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. You see what I'm saying? That's how God is not ashamed of them, to be associated with them. So the suggestion for the reader here is very clear that returning to Judaism would be to abandon the vision, a demonstration of loss of faith and a rejection by God. Also the idea that Christians are like pilgrims who are only passing through on their way to a better place is expressed right here. It's, 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 it's driven uh, on by their vision of faith. Why do we continue to do what we do? Because we, we see something. There's a vision of faith taking place. Then in verses 17 to 19, he says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Then he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, uh, from which he also received him back as a type. So the author refers back to Abraham here one last time. And he says, you know, Abraham responded to God's call and promise with faith. And now the author describes how Abraham responded with faith to God's test. And the test was to ask him to sacrifice his only son. And Abraham's faith was such that it was obeyed, excuse me, that it obeyed God even beyond understanding. At this point, I am relatively sure that Abraham had no clue what was God doing? What was he thinking? Okay, I'm supposed to have a, pros a posterity. I'm, you know, numerous people after me. I move to this place. I wander. I have no land, you know, no children for you know, a long, long time. And finally, I get one son. Okay, so I can kind of believe maybe out of this son there'll be a lot of, you know, a lot of people come from him, descendants. But now he's asked me to offer him up in sacrifice. So this is faith beyond understanding. He was in the process, as we know the story, of offering up the only son through which God had said his descendants would come. But Abraham believed nevertheless. He believed not that God would prevent him from doing it, but that he would resurrect Isaac if necessary in order to fulfill his promise. That's the part that he believed. He says that God is able to raise people even from the dead. So in effect, that's what happens, uh, what happened because Isaac, you know, he was as good as dead since Abraham was fully about to sacrifice him when God stopped him. And so Abraham demonstrated the kind of faith that restores one from death so that all his descendants have an example of how faith overcomes everything, including death. And so when we move on to uh, verse 20, um, uh, he's going to shorten the stories. You know, uh, I call this the, like the final parade because he's parading the Jewish history in front of his readers. And so now in shorter sequences, the author will parade an entire series of Old Testament characters who passed a variety of trials in life, but they never wavered in their faith. And so he begins with uh, uh, Isaac. He says, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau even regarding things to come, passing on the blessings to his sons that had been given to him by his father, even in seeing the weakness and imperfections of his conflicting children, Esau and Jacob. Nevertheless, you know, nevertheless, Isaac passed on the blessings. Verse 21, by faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. You know, Jacob then passed on the blessing to his grandsons and he refused to be buried in Egypt, giving instructions that his bones ultimately be returned to the land that was originally promised, even on his dying bed in a foreign country. 
He said, God will fulfill that promise one day and I want my bones to be buried there. Um, Joseph, uh, by faith it says, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. So not only Jacob gave that command, but Jacob's son Joseph made a similar request concerning his burial, which was carried out when the Israelites eventually left Egypt many centuries later. Now he talks about Moses and he says, by faith, uh, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through a dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. And so the recounting of the life of Moses, in the recounting of it, the author shows how faith was present from the beginning all the way to the end. He was hidden at birth. How? Well, by the faith of his parents. Uh, he refused to deny his Jewish birth. How? By faith. He chose to be associated with his people and he suffered for it. How? By faith. He led the people out of Egypt despite the danger. How? By faith. He kept the Passover, which saved the Jews and did it by faith. They crossed the Red Sea. How? By faith. And so all of these high points are recalled to show that Moses was a man of faith and faith enabled him to see God's promises and the vision enabled him to respond to all of the challenges that he faced with great courage. He goes on, verse 30, to talk about Joshua. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now of course Joshua's name is not mentioned here, but Joshua's great faith is alluded to in this, uh, in this event. Um, and then Rahab, <coughs> excuse me, he says, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And so the prostitute who risked her life in order to hide the Jewish spies, again, her courage prompted by what? By her vision of faith. And then of course, we have a whole miscellaneous group, verses 32 to 38. And so we read in verse 32, it says, and what more shall I say, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and uh, imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. So now here we see the author kind of speeding up his procession, not giving individual testimonies, but only highlights of stories that he is sure that his audience is familiar with. He's got no time or space to list all of the things that faith produces in men and women. Courage, deliverance from death, victory, ability to persevere in severe trial, as well as rejection and scorn uh, from the world. And so now after you know, giving that example, one other comment he's going to make, verse 39 and 40, he says, and all of these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. So in his Final comment, the author expands on his previous uh, comments concerning the faith of, of, of all of these uh, people. The, the point of all of this is that these people lived and suffered and died 
never losing faith, but they did not receive the promises. They didn't get them. The freedom from sin, the forgiveness, the true relationship with God, eternal life, they, they didn't receive those, those gifts. This was not because God was cruel, but rather because God did not want these people to receive the blessings before we in the Christian era received the blessings. It's not that Christians would have an easier time, but rather that they would see and possess the fulfillment of the promises that the people in the Old Testament only saw, only saw it from afar. So let's summarize some of the things we've said here. First of all, Faith has always been what God sought in men from the very beginning. It is what pleases God in us, our faith. Secondly, faith was the basis upon which men could see spiritual realities and have the ability to obey God despite the difficulties. We obey God because of our faith. Thirdly, the history of the Jews is a history of faith. History of the Jewish nation is a history of faithful men and women in action, and the author is demonstrating this. All of the people he talked about, he talks about what they did because of their faith. Number four, in the Old Testament, people died without receiving the promises, but through faith, they saw them from afar. Number five, in the New Testament, these promises are here and they are grasped by faith. So we need to understand that God requires the same thing from us as He did from the people that are mentioned in this chapter. Without faith, we can't please Him. Without faith, we cannot see the promises. Without faith, we will not have the ability to resist temptation or overcome trials that each of us will have to face in order to finish our lives as Christians. So, you, you, know, you may be going along now without too much thought to your faith, thinking all is well, but when the day of trial comes, then your faith will be examined. And I hope and I do pray that your faith will be strong. Your faith will be the kind of faith that enabled these people mentioned in this chapter to persevere and ultimately receive the uh, promises of God. Okay, that's uh, chapter number uh, 12 in our series uh, on Hebrews, two more to go. We'll pick this up uh, at another time. Thank you for your attention.